taught, we called it Light of Fire. Uh, I think the ladies led a fire over the weekend. <laughs> Hallelujah at their conference. Great, great response. Great, great crowd. Great ladies. Just uh, Brother Joe wants to give you a hand. Amen. <laughs> So uh, since that works so well, let's preach on it again. <laughs> let's do part two of Light of Fire. And that's exactly what I believe the Lord is up to in our church and in our lives. And I pray that's the same for you as an individual. But I've been seeing and sensing from, the, from, from people and what God's doing in people's hearts and lives that, that that's what's going on. Uh, last week I shared this message and we started with this passage out of John 15 verses 5 through 8. Where Jesus is speaking, remember this is right before the cross. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and they cast them to the fire and they're burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish. It will be done for you. For my Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Now, I know some prosperity preachers who like to take this passage completely out of context, especially when it talks about answered prayer and praying for what you want in life. Ask whatever you wish. Ask whatever you want. That is the way it reads. But please understand, this is nestled between two things uh, at the front and at the back that say, abide in me and my words abide in you. It ends with abide in me. I abide in you. My Father's glorified that you bear much fruit. It doesn't say my Father's glorified that you just ask for whatever you want and get so you can have a whole bunch of stuff at your house. <laughs> and that's the way sometimes prosperity preachers have a tendency to read that verse. But what it is saying and the context of what it's saying and the power of what it's saying is based upon the premise. This promise is based upon the premise that you are abiding in Christ and Christ is in you. And here's the beauty of that. If you're abiding in Christ... And Christ is truly abiding in you. The things you wish for, the things you desire are completely different than what they were prior to that. When you were just trusting and leaning on your own independent life apart from God. But isn't it amazing that when we get in Jesus and Jesus is in us and we're truly living that life and walking that walk. Isn't it truly powerful what God does with us and through us when we allow him to do it? He said, what happens is the natural byproduct of this abiding process is fruit is born. We talked about that in the context of what fruit is, but it's all first, uh, obviously, the, it's the presence of Jesus. He's the fruit. He's the love. He's the joy. He's the peace. He's the kindness that's manifest through my personality and through your life when we're resting in Jesus and we're being filled with the Spirit. The other fruit, which I believe this is more indicative of and what it's really pointing to is the fact that lives will be changed. Jesus said, I've come to seek and save the lost. That's fruit. Lives being changed. That's fruit. That's the message he's giving throughout the last days when he's, when he's talking to his disciples prior to the cross, John 15, John 16, when he's speaking to them, when they meet in the upper room, when they're leaving the upper room, when they're talking about the presence of the Holy Spirit and how he'll come along and he'll be, a, he'll, he'll be a comforter and he'll fill your life and he'll give you the power to preach the word of God with boldness. It's the idea here is that God impacts my life. Praise God for that. I'm glad I'm not going to go to hell. I don't know about you. Amen. I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I know Jesus. But greater than that still is the fact I'm glad that God wants to use you and use me in the process of reaching other people for Christ. We're here, not for ourselves. The end all is not me getting out of earth and into heaven. It's heaven getting in me and getting out into the earth through me because Jesus is abiding in me and I'm abiding in him. That's, that's the, the message of the context of that message last week where we looked at, where we looked at what, the, what the Lord's plan is for our lives and what it means to light a fire. The ladies just finished this great uh, event. Now, the, the object, please understand, there, there is a, a strategy at Believer's Fellowship that behind everything we do is to fulfill the great commandment. Some people call it the great commission of to reach people, to make disciples of all nations. That when we do something, we do it with an objective. When we do something, the strategy that's being carried out, whether it's the planning, the preparation, the prayers, the, even the printing of bulletins, it's all for one purpose, to bring glory to God by bearing much fruit. That's our desire. That's what we want to see. That, that's the goal. People, people have accused me. They say, well, Brother Joe, you seem to, to preach with a strategy in mind sometime. Like that was a bad thing. <laughs> I'm always preaching with something in mind. All right. And it, this, is, this is the mind of it, that God might be glorified, that we might bear much fruit. That, that's why we do what we do. 
17% of the people who come to know the Lord Jesus Christ get saved as a result of what you might, or I might call event evangelism, such as a revival, a crusade, a conference that you just had. The conference is coming up with the men's ministry. Close to 20% of all people who come to Jesus, this is the way they come. It's an opportunity for Christians to use that platform to bring people who, who might not come to a Sunday morning event, to bring them to a unique event where things are going on, where the atmosphere is charged with, a, with excitement and the presence of God so that we might preach the gospel and share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We might speak up and be witnesses for the Lord Jesus. I mentioned last week that at the trial of Jesus, no one came to bear witness with a true witness. All that came forward were liars. All that came forward were paid liars, as a matter of fact. And they gave a testimony that was not a true testimony. We do not want to be guilty of that same sin of silence that those disciples were when they abandoned Jesus at his arrest. We want to stand with Christ, for Christ, in this hour that God has given us to stand like at no other time. We're living in one of the most desperate, difficult, hard days I believe the world has seen. These are difficult times. And they will not get better if left up to the men to make them better. We need God to move in our communities. We need God to move through our church. We need God to move in, in our state and in our nation like at no other time. I believe the key to seeing that kind of revival starts right here at this address in Spring, Texas, where Believers Fellowship meets. We can see God do something. It can pour out of here. This is a national election year. I know a lot of people out there saying who they're going to vote for. You say, well, Joe, have you going to put out a voter's guide? We do every Sunday. <laughs> this is the voter's guide. If, it doesn't, if they, their qualifications don't match the standards of these, what they stand for, the moral compass they have, the position for life, the position to be pro-life, the position to be pro-Christian, the position to be, you know, unashamedly have a country where we can proclaim Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We can obviously say with clarity, and it means something, we say one nation under God, indivisible under God with justice and liberty. We can say that there's a standard, a criteria, which the Bible talks about when, when, a, when a nation's leaders are righteous, that the people rejoice. So what we want to do, the obvious message from that is, let's look for righteous leaders. So I'm going to vote for that candidate I believe stands closest to biblical values. Because there's a lot out there who sound real good and promise you everything, but when it comes to morality and conviction and the Bible, yeah, they got one somewhere. So we're living at a time that, 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 that we need to make our voice heard. I believe we ought to be involved not only in politics, but in every avenue of the world that we live in today. And we ought to be involved on a level that's different maybe from what you're thinking. We ought to be involved on a level of bringing light into the darkness, where we light a fire, where we stand for Christ and make a difference. We don't want to be, as I said, silent in witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there's been millions of surveys that have been, been done over, over, over a lots of time, taken around the world, and pretty much they give, come back all the same. They indicate that approximately 98% of Christians do not regularly introduce anyone to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not that it's somewhere in their life they haven't, but on any regular basis, any commitment to having that kind of ministry through their life, 98% is just not a reality in their life. But that wasn't with the way it was with the Lord Jesus. Everywhere he was, everywhere he went, he was about preaching the gospel, sharing the good news, that light has come into the darkness, that there's hope, that there's abundance, that there's peace, that there's life now in the present life and life in the life to come. And that he would be the sacrifice to make that all possible. So wherever Christ was at, was at he, was, he was touching people uniquely, individually many times, just speaking to them. There, there was someone who did a study, I, I wrote it down because it was, it, I thought it was pretty unique to see that kind of ministry of touching people that Jesus had. Many people think, well, Jesus' main ministry was in the synagogues or the temple. But if you take all four gospels, there's about 132 instances where Jesus had contacts with people as individuals, not as groups. About 132 different places. As, as you looked at those lists and go down the list of who they were and where they were, six of the people he had contact were only in the temple. Just six, only six in the temple. In the synagogues and the surrounding communities, we only see a four instances where Jesus is doing that personal ministry of actually taking an individual and touching them in that situation. All the others, 122 other accounts, were with people out in the mainstreams of life. 
going throughout the affairs of their daily world and their daily lives. Whether it would be at a, in the streets, or whether it would be speaking to people individually about religious things, or whether it was the scribes or the Pharisees, or having them bring someone to them, or he talks to that woman and tells her she's free and she's forgiven. All these other instances of Jesus contact people that we have recorded, we know there were many more, but those things that are recorded are far outweigh what you might call a religious assembly. But all too often, that's where we think of, we think about religion and, and God and, and the gospel, of, you know, just within the church house. But no, the reality is this, that we truly, as we stated last week and many, many other times, we truly are ambassadors for Christ. We represent a kingdom. We speak on behalf of a king. We represent that king. We represent that king's kingdom and the message of that kingdom. We are the avenues by which God has chosen to share that kingdom and the message of that kingdom with the rest of the world. That's the way, according to scripture, it's to be done. Clarity is given when Jesus is speaking that last message in the book of Acts to the disciples. When he said, listen, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. You therefore, you go make disciples of all nations. There's the goal, make disciples, make disciples. You know, no matter what we do, even as a church, the, the bottom line lies in that we make disciples. We can say, well, we're here for such a time as this, but what, what, what are we doing for here? Why, why are we here for such a time as this? We're making disciples. Every event, I, I don't care if it's a ladies Bible study, a lift group, a, a Sunday morning message, uh, a, a time where we get together in, in conferences. It really boils down to that bottom line. We're, we're here to make disciples. How do you do that? You bring someone to Christ. You teach them how to grow in that faith and that life. And you keep bringing people to Christ and you keep teaching them. And those people bring people to Christ and they keep discipling. So it's an ongoing process. You, you really can't separate evangelism, winning someone to Christ, apart from discipleship. They're not, they really are inseparable. To make disciples is what we've been called to do. Make, doesn't say make converts, you know. Doesn't say proselyte people to your, to your church. It says make disciples. So what we do in, in the context, if I'm really going to light a fire, the fire is not about me. The fire is about shining for the purpose of glorifying God and that him being glorified as a result of that in my life. So understand, even in the life of Jesus, you see this, this carried out. There was a survey of people who were attending training sessions for Billy Graham Crusades. And it was interesting as they, as they did these surveys over the years through, through the Graham Ministries. Uh, this particular one came out of Detroit. And they were asked, uh, to, uh, the people there who were coming in to be trained as counselors, all right? These were Christians. What, what is your greatest hindrance to witnessing? Now, a lot of us don't have any problem whatsoever witnessing here at church. All right. Or maybe somebody comes to the altar and we're, we, we see, we're, we're seeking to counsel with them in this environment. And, and, you know, we many times have trained counselors for different events and things. And, you know, you don't have any problem talking to people like that. But it's, it's another thing when it comes outside the realm of the building and we're out in that sphere of supposed influence that we're supposed to have and we're out in the world. Here's the way, here's the, way the results came back from that. 90 or 9 percent said they were just too busy to remember to do it. Now, don't laugh at that because that's probably the majority in reality. Uh, I'll give you an illustration. Sundays, I'm real tired by the end of Sunday. I go to bed, I gotta get up about five o'clock, 5.30 and head for the airport because I'm flying out to Belize for a quick whirlwind planning preparation trip. I gotta go negotiate with hotels and then sit down with the, 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 the national leaders for the Baptist and meet with them about the conference we're gonna plan and then I need to go down and work on the, from there, I gotta go down to Dan Griega. So I get there, uh, I get on the airplane, Get off the airplane, run over to the rental car place, grab a car, head for Belize City, sit down immediately before I even get to my room, and I'm sitting in a negotiation room over the conference. And we're dealing with costs and factors and food factors and all the things will be part of how many rooms we want for the conference and all those things. And so we negotiate that deal. Then I finally get to my room and I lay down and I realize, well, I better grab some lunch. It's about two o'clock. So I, I grab some lunch and I say, you know, uh, I got I to gotta get everything ready for the, the uh the next meeting I'm going to have is down in Dan Griega, and in the morning I've got to go negotiate with hotels there, and I also got to meet with the local pastors there that night. So I'm, I'm, I'm studying everything, working on it, getting it all together. I finally lay my head down at bed, got it all ready to go, because I, I know I've got to get up real early in the morning and drive down to Dan Griega, simply because they're working on the Hummingbird Highway. Maybe you all that with those who've been to Belize, that little terrible road that goes through the hills. It's in terrible shape from the rainy season. 
So I know it's going to take me about an hour extra longer, so I have to get up real early for that one. So I'm laying there in bed at night, and I'm thinking about all the things we're going to do for Jesus and how good it's going to be. And I'm thinking, oh, what an idiot. You didn't even witness the guy sitting beside you on the airplane. Too busy? I'm doing too much for God here? <laughs> in my head, getting everything ready to miss the opportunity? Because airplanes, you know, they're kind of like jails. It's captive audience. <laughs> they're buckled in. They can't go anywhere for two hours, except the bathroom. And they can't stay in there the whole flight. So you've got a captive audience. So you know, this is not, this, you know, I think this is what Jesus said. Men do not light a candle and put it under a bushel. The bushel represented the material world and just the busyness of the world around us. Men do not light a candle. The other one said don't put it on a bed, which represents just slothfulness. But men light a candle and they place it on a lampstand. They get it up where everybody in the house can see the light that's shining. So this isn't such a, a far reach here. 28% said they just felt the lack of real information to share. They said, I, I don't have what it takes information-wise or I hadn't been trained to, to do it properly. Uh, and by the way, 12% said their own lives were not speaking as they should. In other words, they didn't feel that their walk matched their talk, so they just keep their mouth shut. You got that logic all completely wrong. Adjust your walk to match your talk, and then you can talk all you want. And you can talk while you walk. <laughs> Amen? So this is, this is something where we get our priorities so messed up, we don't have the capacity to reason properly, and that enters in. By the way, on this result, nobody said when they took this survey, nobody checked the box says, I really just don't care. And I, that's probably true because I do believe if, if you have experienced Christ in your life, that most of you care. You know, we, we, we know we ought to do that. We, that's a concern in our life. We know that people are hurting. We, we care. We, we, there's a love for God that's in us. And God put that in. It's just not, not a natural thing because we're naturally selfish. But God's done a work in our hearts and life if we really are children of God to, to do something unique, to make a difference in the world around us. And we sense that in our life and there is a desire, but all these other things that, that, that get in the way. The largest group, over 51% said it was just a fear of how other people would react when they tried to share the gospel with them. Nobody likes to be rejected Nobody likes to be ridiculed and nobody wants to be regarded as uncool or an oddball of sorts. We all want to be accepted. That's, that's a great drive and desire of our life is acceptance. That's why kids strive to be popular and people you know, want to make more money by us so they can be popular and all the stuff that goes along with that mindset. But we have to realize that it's more important to be popular with Jesus and with the lost world than it is to be popular with, with the world in general. Our, our, our message, you know, it needs to be understood by our own mind sometimes that it's not about this issue of me and my personality and what people are going to say about me. It's an issue of their eternal soul and their eternal life. There's a, there's a lot of reasons, I think, that come to mind. I've, I've, I've tried to list a few of me this morning and see if maybe they don't fall in the, within the spectrum of your own so-called excuses, re reason we just don't do it, you know. And we'll call them excuses because that's just about all, really all they come down to. Excuse number one is, is, is popular in some circles. Uh, people say, well, you know, I have a pastor. I pay to do that. You can't pay anybody to do your work in the kingdom of God. You're a lift group leader, your Sunday school teacher, your Bible group leader, whatever it is. They can't do what God's called you to do. They can encourage you. They can inform you. They can equip you. They can help you. They can prompt you, promote you, prod you, whatever it takes. But hey, you got to do it. You have a responsibility. And Matthew 5 says, you are the light of of the world. You are. Now that doesn't mean your, your pastor is. <laughs> Although he's the light of the world, you too are the light of the world. You are the city that's set on the hill. None of us can escape that. None of us can escape the fact that we've been reconciled to God so that we can be reconcilers of other men to God. None of us can escape the fact that we've been called to be ambassadors for Christ. This is our responsibility. Nobody can do that for us. There's a great passage in Genesis chapter one, in about six verses, maybe eight verses, where this little phrase comes, it says, after his own, its own kind. And it's, it's the creation account. And God creates, it says, the vegetables and the, and, and, the, and, and the plant life. And it says, and they were given the capacity by God, it says, to create after their own kind. All right? Uh, so which came first, the tree or the seed? Well, the tree came first, all right? And produced the seed. 
then it goes on, it talks about the trees and it talks about the, the animals and it says, and they were, they produced after their own kind. And it talks about the fish and swarmed the sea and the great sea and after their own kind, they produced. In other words, God gave the capacity for each one of these created things to increase the population of their particular kind. Even when Adam and Eve were placed in the garden, God constructed them in such a way so that they could produce after their own kind, which is another reason I'm not pro-homosexual. You can't produce after your own kind, all right? It doesn't work that way for those who haven't been to biology class yet, all right? <laughs> after your own kind. Now, as believers, we're certainly called to bear much fruit. All right, what does that mean? That means produce after your own kind. What kind? Christian kind. People that know Jesus. Yes, we can seek to do that in our families and with our children, but it goes well beyond that spectrum into the world that we live in of reaching people and producing after our own kind. There's this passage that you're familiar with maybe in Acts chapter eight where Paul, uh, Saul before he becomes Paul says he was consenting unto his death, talking about Stephen's death. And at that time, all, there was great persecution against the church was at, which is at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, hailing men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word of God. Now, there's a passage which says these people weren't interested in their personal safety. These people weren't interested in their personal reputation. These people weren't interested in saving face to get a pay raise or a higher place in the job hierarchy. These were people who understood that they were the salt and the light. They were ambassadors for Christ and they were called to make disciples of all nations. And even though as they were being dispersed out of their homes, away from each other and their families, they were still going out and speaking the word of God. They were still preaching the word of God. Now, it's no different for this century church than the first century church. God hadn't changed his approach and God hadn't changed his means and God hadn't changed his methods. It's still about you and me, our job, our lifestyle, our commitment. And it's really not even something we do. When you really get the context of all this, it's about who we are. We are the children of light. We're the children of God. What do children of God do? They bring in other people to be children of God. They introduce the gospel. They share Christ with the lost world. That's, that's just something that, that flows as the byproduct. If you want to read the characteristics of those early church, go through the book of Acts and you see time after time after time where they're just reaching people at the cost of their own lives, the cost of their family's lives, the cost of their reputation, the cost of their jobs. They just kept doing it anyway. They kept moving forward. Now, <clears throat> along with that one about, you know, uh, it's not my job, I think that flows out of this next one, which really is, I'm afraid of being rejected. Let me help you deal with that. You have to move away from the mentality that I must win everybody. Because the reality is, you can't win anybody. Jesus wins them, you speak to them. You give them opportunity. You share the message with them. It's Christ that transforms a heart. It's Christ that, in his spirit that convicts a person of their sin and draws them to the cross, but they must hear that message. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. So when the word of God comes, the Holy Spirit's job is to take that word from your lips into their heart and into their life and move supernaturally in it. But so often we're, we, we put ourselves above that. And remember, if they do reject you, it's not really you. The Bible says it's Christ that they're rejecting. But let's don't be guilty of that sin of silence even at the cost of thinking that it might be us. I love what Paul, so many people think of Paul, the big, bad, bold Paul. They see him coming in like, you know, the gospel Rambo into a community. Here's, here's what Paul said when he said, I'm coming to Corinth and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach the gospel to you guys. But he said it was in weakness and fear and with much trembling. There was a lot of resistance to Paul. There was a lot of resistance to his message. He'd been hated by the Roman Empire. He'd been hated by the Jews who wouldn't receive the gospel who rejected Messiah. Everywhere he went, he was fighting this fight and dealing with these issues and dealing with these problems. And here was a guy who spent most of his life trying to rise to the top to be the most respected Jew of all Jews, to be that, 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 that guy at the top of the heap who knew all the right answers and had all the information and possessed all this religious uh, uh, wisdom of his. 
She finally said, I count all that is done that I might win Christ. That I might be used by God. That I might be used for the glory of God. That I might know God. I think sometimes, you know, we, we're afraid of being rejected. And we do not realize that it's such a ploy of, of satanic forces and Satan working overtime in our minds to keep us deceived about the truth of this. The truth is this, that every time I do share the gospel, I am most happy and most content. That every time somebody comes to Christ, I am the most happy and the most content when I see people's lives have changed. And Satan doesn't want you to see that because if you ever get a hold of that and see that in your life, you'll turn your world upside down. Because of the joy that it brings to your own heart. Uh, you know, you're familiar with D.L. Moody. We quote him every once in a while around here. He was a great pastor and evangelist. He, he pastored a church in Chicago. One day he's walking down the street in Chicago and he, he saw a man leaning against the lamppost there and, and he reached over and put his hand on the man's shoulder. And the guy, uh, and he asked him, he said, uh, are you a Christian? And so the guy got real mad and raised his fist in Moody's face and said, uh, uh, why don't you mind your own business? To which D.L. Moody responded, I'm sorry if I've offended you, sir, but to be very frank, this is my business. This is our business. This is who we are. This is what we do. Sorry I offended you, but this is my business. Sorry that, that hurt your feelings, but this is my business. I'm here on the king's business. I'm here on God's business. I live for God's business. We all, if we're children of God, this is our business. This, this is what we do. Along the line again with this is that same thing as I'm afraid of what my friends will think, you know, even those who may be the closest to me. I guess the first question would be, what do they think of you now? It's a fair question, isn't it? What do they think of me now? Why don't we really give them something to think about? Start sharing Jesus, see what they think. In John, it says this. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If they did this to Jesus, don't think they won't do it to you. If they rejected me, they're going to reject you. We cannot be people pleasers. Pleasers of men. Even the people that are close to us and, and our friends and people we care about. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, the apostles writing says, listen, our exhortation doesn't come from error. This isn't a lie. It's not impurity or by the way of deceit. In other words, we're not trying to deceive anybody. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, there's a powerful statement. God has entrusted you with this, with the gospel. You've been approved. So we speak not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. It's not about pleasing people. In fact, the greatest way you'll ever please anybody is for them to see them get, to see them get saved and come to know Christ. You talk about being pleasing, they're going to be extremely pleased. And they'll probably be a closer friend than you've ever had in your life. But the, the issue here is that I can't put that before I put God. And I can't put that before the message about what I think and might perceive with my little puny mind what their response might be. Because I do not know. I do know that God has counted me worthy, it says here. Approved me, in other words. And entrusted me with this message. And I'm responsible not just to, 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 to live it, but to speak it, to walk it and to talk it. Now, as you follow the sequence of logic here, there's a couple more things that come out of this. And, and you would think in the survey, what most people say, this is what comes up next. You know, and that's where Paul talks about being a pleaser of God or a pleaser of men. But this is here, it, it comes down to this. I, I just don't know how. Let me read you this passage from 1 John, because this is how. What was from the beginning, what we've heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we have beheld and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, and that life, the word of life, the life was manifested. Who is that? Jesus. And we have seen and we bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. What's he saying? I'm only telling you about what I know about. So if I say I don't know how to do it, I'm saying I don't know what I did. And that's ridiculous. When you gave your heart to Jesus, you should have known what you did. You owned up to the fact that you were separated from God. You owned up to the fact that you were a sinner. You owned up to the fact that God loved you so much that he sent his own son to die on the cross to take your sins. And you have to own up to the fact that I prayed and asked him to forgive me of my sins. I trusted him as my Lord and Savior. I repent and believe. That's the gospel message. I believe in Jesus, the Son of God. Lived a perfect life. Sacrificed himself for me and on the cross. Sacrificed himself for all men on the cross. Gave himself up. I believe that. 
I believe that he rose three days later from the dead, and I believe he's coming back again. That's what we believe. You know, how many of you know that, raise your hand. And you know how to share the gospel. That's all he's saying. Hey, I, John's just saying, hey, I'm just telling you what I know. What we've seen, what we heard, what we handled, word of life, eternal life, Jesus, in him is eternal life. I'm just telling you what I, that's what we proclaim. I'm, I'm telling you this, here's this, I'm telling you this so you can have fellowship with us because I fellowship with the Father. So come on, join the family, join the relationship because fellowship with the Father is what the whole message is about. We might know God, we might walk with God. So do you understand how simple this really is? That, uh, aren't you glad the Bible doesn't say you got to have a college degree to do this? Try finding the college that offered that course. <laughs> aren't you glad that God didn't say you have to be the smartest guy, the best looking woman in, in, in the world to be able to share this? You had to have the best talent, the best gift. No, no, he doesn't do that. I mean, even if you do this bad, it's still good. Even if you stutter, even if you make a mistake, but what God cannot use is silence. What he will use is your words, which brings us in the context of the same thing. You know, I just, I just don't know how. Here it is, I don't know enough. If I knew more. My best illustration of this is that demoniac of the Gadarenes, you know, the guy's cutting himself, running around naked in the cemetery. He gets delivered, set free, and he comes to Jesus. And says, we got in the ship with Jesus, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed, and he asked Jesus that he might be with him. Can I travel with you guys? Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, go home to your friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for you and had compassion on you. And he departed and he began to publish in Decapolis how great things that Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. Here's a guy who's nuts. Here's a guy who's out of his mind. Here's a guy who is the reject of all culture, all society. Here's a guy nobody wants anything to do with because he's literally bonkers. Isn't he? I mean, look at the description of him. He's running around buck naked through the cemetery, screaming, cutting himself with stones. He probably fit in with some cultures here today, though. Excuse me, I better back that up. Not everybody. But here's a guy who's just, he just, he's obviously crazy. And then Jesus touches him and sets him free. And then he puts him in the ministry. Excuse me. <laughs> You don't do that to somebody like that. Jesus did. That's a, that's a hard lesson to learn for most of us. What equips us for sharing the gospel? Getting saved. What equips us for sharing the gospel? Just get saved. Get saved. Now you ready to share. Anybody here saved? Four of you, good. All five of us can go share the gospel. <laughs> Hallelujah. Are you saved? Are you really saved? Yes. Then you have been equipped. You have the degree you need to share the gospel. Hallelujah. You have been born again with this capacity to preach and to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the issue is, is will I do it? Don't get brought into this little excuse here, common excuse of my life speaks. All right. First Corinthians makes it very clear. Though that it's since the wisdom of God in this through the world. And this is amazing because in other words, what he's saying is the world won't discover this by itself. The, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its, its wisdom did not come to know God and they never will of their own wisdom. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Now this is important because these are biblically inspired, spiritually inspired words that God is saying the world doesn't get this on its own and they never will. Nobody's just going to logically say, oh, you know, I think I ought to get saved. Because worldly wisdom never leads that direction. It always takes you the other way. Worldly wisdom always says, get for yourself. Love yourself. Be the best. Be on top. Make others pay attention to you. You know, you know do your own thing. Have your own success. You know, forget what everybody else wants, says, or does. You know, have men serve you. But God's wisdom then is, is completely different. And God said, here's the way the world's going to hear this message. Through your testimony through your life. Now, I don't, I don't understand that completely because to me, you know, I'm, my wisdom, at least my worldly wisdom, would say, hey, why don't you put angels on every corner in the street in America? You got plenty of them. People wouldn't believe that either. What they believe is a life they can see that's been changed in front of their eyes. 
What they see and believe is what you come through when your heart is right with God and you begin to speak and proclaim the Word of God and you share the message. You've heard me say it before. When your heart is right with God, your mouth gets in gear. It follows. The worst excuse I've heard, and it's common more than you believe, we're living what I would call, and, and many people refer to sociologists do, as the post-Christian era. In other words, we used to live in the Christian era, but now Christianity is not important and it doesn't dominate culture anymore. All right, we're past that, in other words, what the world says. So we're living in this post-Christian era where the influence is not predominantly Christian anymore. And in this predominantly post-Christian era, here's what the world says and here's what people believe. Well, people already know the gospel and they don't want to hear it. People don't know the gospel. They don't know it. And the only way they'll believe it is when they hear it. You know, that, I mean, think about this for a moment. In the Gospels, the most religious people of the day were the Pharisees, all right? There was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews, a leader. He didn't understand the Gospel. He didn't get it. As well as we see through, through history of Scripture that many of them didn't get it. We, we have to drop, you know, the excuse of, of saying that people know because people don't know You'd be surprised how many children in our nation today do not understand the Christmas story. It has been removed from their sight mostly by the culture that we're living in, by the government that we now have in our nation. They remove every semblance of God. All the Ten Commandments must be taken down. All the nativity scenes must be removed. We've got to do away with this Christ and Christmas stuff. So there's millions of people in our own country in America that says in God we trust on our coins that don't understand the gospel message and do not know the gospel message. In the book of Acts at chapter 6, there was a woman named Lydia, the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics. A worshiper of God was listening and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. She wanted to know God, but she was worshiping God ignorantly. Paul said the same thing himself. I worship God ignorantly. In, 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 in the book of Acts, Paul goes up to Mars Hill Mars Hills in Athens. It's a place where all the philosophers and all the educators and all the brilliant, you know, minds of the Greek culture and Greek, con uh, 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 you know, people would gather and listen to each other as they talk about gods. All over Mars Hill were images, idols to God. Many gods. Uh, that's the way the world believes today. I told you last week in a recent survey, 65% of Christians in America will tell you there's more than one way to get to heaven. They don't know the gospel. That's not the gospel. People don't know the gospel. And God's way for them to know the gospel is for you and me to tell it to them. To rehearse it over and over and over again. What's the old hymn? I love to tell the story. That's, that's what we have to come back to in our life. I love to tell that story. I love to talk about Jesus. I love to talk about the gospel. Here's a woman who was looking for God, thought she'd found God, didn't even know God. Mars Hill, with, finally, there were so many idols being erected on Mars Hill that the council of the Greeks decided there'll be no more idols made here and they erected one final idol and they titled it to the unknown God. In case yours isn't here on the crowd, we, we'll just make this one yours. Paul comes to the crowd and says, this time of ignorance God has winked at, but now commands all men everywhere repent and come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only true God. People don't know. And people that think they do know, don't know that, hey, there's only one way to come to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. And there's only way to come to Jesus Christ, and that's selflessly. You have to humble yourself. You can't still be in charge of your own life. You still, it comes to a matter of faith and trust and belief. And belief means I follow. Follow Jesus. Maybe you're sitting here today, and you think you know the gospel, but you never repented of your sins, and you don't know the gospel. You've never really given your heart to Christ. You don't know the gospel. But I prayed the prayer. Hey, these people I'm filling up Mars Hill were praying prayers. Lydia was praying prayers. But not to the right God, not to the truth. Simply, it, what's required, I think we, we get to this point where, where, it, where, it's, where we get to the point and say, hey, I'm going to obey God. I mean, if you really want to take something home today, just say, I'm going to obey God. And not only am I going to obey God, if the message is my testimony, the Word of God, my testimony, then I'm going to start sharing my testimony. In fact, I would sit down if I were you and I'd write your testimony about two minutes out. And I'd just intersperse a few scriptures in there. You know, 
So, I mean, I, 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 my life was miserable. Why was I miserable? Because, you know, the Bible says all men are born sinners apart from God. How can I have life apart from God? And I realized my life was going nowhere. The Bible says wages of sin is death. You know, just what we call the Roman road, those scriptures that relate to salvation and confessing Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you know, the repentance. Just, just weave that in your testimony. There's the gospel. I don't know how. That's how. You just share the word of God and how you trusted it and how it made a difference in your life and you're ready to go. You don't have to go through Christian witness training and evangelism explosion. Those are all good. You should take those if you've never done it. Sharpen your tools. It never hurts to sharpen your tools, amen? And keep, keep, keep sharp and right in your instruments. But hey, it starts with you just having a heart that's ready to go. Know what, what you say, how do I do that? Well, sit down right before, before I knew Christ. Then right next, how, how I met Christ. Then right down, now, what's God doing in my life right now? And just share right that way. You can share it in a minute and a half. And then I would say for each and every one, if you haven't been through something like that, take time. All you got to do is go to any Christian bookstore. There's plenty of information on how to share your faith. Some guy said, well, brother, I need to learn how to break the ice. Let me tell you, here's the simplest icebreaker. And every one, every one of these programs you'll buy at the bookstore has, has what we call the icebreaker. How do you break an ice? Well, I usually take a pick. Don't you? There's no way around it. If you're going to break the ice, it's going to take a pick. You have to interject yourself into whatever the situation is. All right? That's how you break it. There's no other way to break ice. You can't pray it down. You just have to step into it. Step on it. Push it. Kick it. Whatever it takes. I'm just waiting for the Lord to open the door, Pastor. Kick it open. In fact, if you look close enough, it really already is unlocked and ready. You just push it open. All right? You know, the best way to open the door is just to open the door. I know how to open the door. Push on it. Some will open automatically. Just get up in front of them. They'll just open. The best way to break the ice is ask a question. Pure and simple. That's it. And if you'll, if you'll look at all the great methods that I've seen and gone through of how to win souls, they always start with what they call a, a question, you know, kind of format. Now, what's EE call it? They call it the... Uh, What's the question? There's a title for it. Come on. How many of you have been through EE? Come on, help me out here. All right. What is it? It's called the what? The what, what, what? They come up and they, boy, there's another name for it. Y'all you know, failed the class. Anyway. The issue is you ask questions. It's something like this. Uh, if you were to die today, we're just going to turn it. Now, the real soft one gets a little, there's another soft one that goes like this. Have you ever given much thought to spiritual things? All right. What is that to pick? Now they're committed. They've got to say something, yes or no. Yeah. And it goes on. It kind of develops with it. With EE, e, it goes from there to, uh, well, if you died right now, where do you think you'd spend eternity? And if they're still not opening the door, say, hey, well, if you had to stand before God at this very moment, and God were to ask you, why should I let you into my glorious heaven? What are you going to tell him? That's your pitch, all right? It could be something as simple as this. Has anybody ever told you about Jesus? I mean, there's, there's, there's lots of questions, but you have to ask them. You've got to interject yourself. You have to pick the eyes. You've got to say something. And that's, you just start a conversation. You know? I don't care if it's, who are you voting for for president? So and so, who are you voting for? Jesus. Jesus, yeah. Do you don't know Jesus? <laughs> Any way you want to do it is how you can do it. But you just need to do it. How many ways are there? Millions of ways. It's just having the courage to do it. So you say, Lord, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm to break the ice. And just be bold. That's where faith comes in your personal life. I'll be bold for Christ today. And I, can, I know I can be bold. Why? Because Christ lives in me. And he said, I'd never stand before anybody where he wouldn't give me an answer for. He's always going to give me something. He's always going to give me what I need. The Lord Jesus loves witnessing. And he loves witnessing through you. And you know how you know he loves wisdom? You do it, and you know with that feeling of joy in your own heart when you've done it, that you've impacted somebody's life. Some of you walk away and say, boy, that was smart. I can't believe I told him that. No, that was Jesus telling you that, okay? Don't take credit for it. You're smart because he's smarter, all right? He gives you what you need, and you pray. Say, Lord, I just want boldness today. The Bible has ultimate many places in Scripture where the people are asking God for boldness. During the persecution, the first century church, they're going to an upper room. They've been persecuted. They've been told they can't preach the gospel. What do they do? They don't say, Lord, do we know we don't know? They didn't go in there and whine. They just said, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto your servants that with all boldness we may speak your word. That's powerful, isn't it? They're threatening me, so give me boldness. 
Acts 4, when they prayed, the place was shaken where they assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And when they were filled, they spoke the word of God with boldness. Ephesians 6, Paul said, pray for me that utterances may be given may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to share the mysteries of the gospel. Pray for boldly. God answers those kind of prayers. And with that, pray for, pray for the opportunities. And not so much as that pray that you would see the opportunities. God, let me see what's going on around me. Let me see the people in their heart, not their face. Let me see where people are at and see what God is doing. How many of you remember giving one of these when you came in? Right. Did any man in this worship center not get one of these when he came in the building? Just raise your hand right quick and make sure you get one in your hand. Back over here on the left. Several over here on the right. One up here on the front. Two up here on the front. We only have one usher. <laughs> Leave your hands up for a moment until they find you. You should have been giving these when, when, you, when you got your bulletin and stuff when you came in. If not, we got one coming to you. Keep your hand up. Ron up here. Now what this is, I don't want you to fill this out right now. I want you to take it home and fill it out. Coming up next on the order of events for Believers Fellowship is our men's conference, a super conference. Ignite. Ladies just finished an incredible weekend. All right. Hallelujah. Go ahead, ladies. Praise the Lord, buddy. <laughs> fill this place up with ladies. We're going to fill this up with men. If I, and listen, I, I'm not being arrogant. Ladies, please do not understand what I'm getting ready to say. But I know if the ladies can put 120, 130, 40 women in this room, we can put three or 400 men in here. I'm not just saying that because it sounds good. Because I believe we're going to do that. And we're going to do it, and we're going to do it together. Now, every goal like that has to have strategy behind it. I'm going to share the strategy with you. All right? You're going to collect about six or eight of these when you leave today. They'll be out in the lobby on the table. These are the invite cards. There's lots of things, that are reasons why guys will want to come. I mean, there's lots of door prizes. All these will be done in the last session. There's a five-day cruise out of Galveston. There's a 30-yacht six-gun. There's three-day Branson. I mean, there's lots of stuff on there and many other things that aren't even on the card that are going to be given away that have been made as gifts. I mean, so there's going to be a lot of things. Every time when, when, when I register and I pay my buy ticket, my name, when I walk through that front door for this conference, will be put in a drawing hat, all right? The little ticket I'll get. For every guest I bring, I get another little ticket put in the deal. If I bring six guests, I now have my name in there seven times. I'm going to take a cruise. If I put it in there 20 times, I've probably got really good odds on taking a cruise. Or at least walking out with a new, with a new rifle. And I, you never have enough guns. Can I say amen? <laughs> now, I really made the ladies mad, haven't I? <laughs> so, those are the opportunities. But let's get back to the reality of this. This is people's lives. Being changed. This is the most dynamic conference layout you're going to be a part of or see in a long time. The speakers, the ministry, the music, what's going to, it's going to be so, there, I mean, this is, this, this is, there's going to be barbecue dinners, going to be breakfast, I mean, all these things are, there'll be a golf tournament, you going to participate in it, all that information on the table as well. But we're going to take a bunch of these and start handing them out as men. All right, now see that little, pair, that little piece of paper I gave you? Look at that, there's about seven or eight, ten lines on there, I'm not sure, I didn't count them when I put them on there. But on, you can write on the back of that line as well. Here's our strategy. We're going to hand these out, and we're going to invite men. And then we're going to start praying for men. I want you to take that and seriously do this. This is, this is, this is how it's going to work. It'll work if you do it. If you don't do it, if you ignore it, if you blow it off, it won't work. But if you want it to work, here's how we do it. You begin to think of, the, of, of people that go on that list that you're going to invite to this conference. All right? Let me give you a little simple acrostic. Fran, F-R-A-N. Some of you know, know, might know a Fran. But this Fran stands for Friends, Relatives, associates and neighbors. When you start developing that list, and this is going to be your prayer list. I don't want you to give it to me. You're going to pray over it daily. You're going to start asking God who put on that list. You're going to ask God for a divine direction. He's going to give it to you. He's going to start laying some names out. First of all, ask God about what friends. You've got some friends that need to be at this meeting, right? Friends outside the church. So you've got friends. You just think of them right now. You know that maybe you hadn't seen them in a long time. Maybe you hadn't been friends with them even lately, but they were a friend. You need to invite them. 
Maybe it's a relative. God knows I probably ought to buy 100 tickets. <laughs> I got some relatives that need to be here. I do. I got some relatives that need to be in this conference. And they probably wouldn't come to some other event we've got going on, but this men's conference with all these things that are going on, all the excitement of it all, and all the door prize and everything else, you know, they'll get an opportunity to win this, by the way, as well. Right? I got some relatives. I'm going to be writing on that list and saying, Lord, I'm going to invite these relatives to be here. Associates. These are people that I'm around. These are people I might bank with. These are people that I might, you know, do business with. These are, might be employees, employers. These are people I, I'm in the world with all the time, all around that I know. They're associates. May not know them real well, but they need to be on this prayer list. The last is neighbors. I mean neighbors. So if you take just those four categories, friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors, and start praying over that area, say, Lord, who do I know that's a friend? Who do I know that's a friend? And start writing those names down. And then you start praying for those names. Out of the 8, 10, 12 names, 15 names you put on there, you're probably going to come up at least three or four that want to come to this conference. If every regular attending man in this church would bring three men, we'd have a house full. That's not so out of reach, is it? Now, here's the challenge. That's, that's step number two or three of the strategy. Here's the next part of the strategy. Got to do it if it's going to work, though. The next part of the strategy is that not only am I going to pray for these men, I'm going to make an investment in these men. I got three men on here, I think, out of my eight, ten that have committed, say they'll come. I'm going to pay their way if they'll come. I'm going to buy their ticket. Tickets are 50 bucks a piece. Don't frown at that because you pay over $200 probably by the time you do any retreat around here. You guys that go to the men's retreat, you go to the men's retreat, that's usually 130 And then you pay for your gas, get up there and back. And then not only pay for your gas, you buy a meal or two while you're there, and plus you're eating while you're there. And then you got, you know, you're going to play the golf, so you're gonna, that's another chunk of change out the window. So before it's all said and done, by the time you've done everything and they ate on the way home, bought the gas on the way home, you've probably spent over $200 anyway. Now here's the beauty of four tickets. You can buy a package if you're a regular attending member of the church. In fact, don't be yourself if you're not, all right? A package of four tickets for 100 bucks. Tickets are individually 50 bucks. But the strategy is this. I challenge every man here to buy one, at least one packet, if not two. Tickets. And you're going to start praying over these names. Let them simmer in the prayer pot for a little while. You're inviting. You're handing out these invitation cards. Hey, I'm going to talk to you about it. Some you ought to come to this. You know, later on when you see him, hey, did you pay attention? Yeah, look at that. It's pretty cool. Tell me a little bit more about it. That guy, been, man, he can sing this guy's name. This guy's unbelievable. This guy here, he was, he, he was a, a Baylor football uh, quarterback, and then he played for, he was Dan Fouts backup for years at San Diego Charter. I mean, just give him a little, you know, a little bit more. Keep, keep salting it a little bit more, you know? Kind of like that, that little cabbage there, that carrot on the stick we keep dragging along. Then finally you go up to him, hey, you know, I, I bought you a ticket if you want to go. Say, this is, these are $50 tickets. You know, and they are individually. If you don't buy them, they're 50 bucks. Now, it's one thing for you to ask him to spend 50 bucks to come. It's another thing for you to put this in his hand. You say, I, I, I'm going to give it to you unless you're coming. No, no, no. You've got to make a promise. <laughs> and we'll put it in the hands of men I believe will come. Now, I think with prayer, all this, I mean, there's tons of preparation going on. This thing's going to be phenomenal. It's going to be the best conference you've ever been to, all right? Food's going to be great, fantastic. Fellowship is going to be incredible. When, when you get several hundred men in this room worshiping God together and you get an invitation, we got this altar filling up with people getting around. Hey, you're going to walk in and say, wow, that's incredible. That's just awesome. That's just incredible. That was, that was big. That was big. In the words of Donald Trump, is huge. <laughs> huge, all right? It's going to be. I, I'm excited about it already. We're, we're just six weeks away. Six weeks. Now, I'm going to ask you to do this even if, you, if you're thinking, well, you know, I, I, I know some people at uh, these kind of, then, then buy two packs if you know a lot of people. Buy three. Uh, this is an investment that's certainly worth its, its, its return. And even if someone comes and doesn't get right with God, man, you have planted a seed that's going to last a long time with them. And they're going to have to deal with it. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do, men. I'm going to ask each every man in here to come to the altar right now. Bring your little piece of paper with you. Don't have to fail it out or anything. Just bring it up here. <laughs> 